couple weeks left. I can get it together, finish all of my assignments, get the grade that I want, you know? Um, speaking of school, though, I'm very, I feel like I'm at a point where I'm kind of automatic in my day-to-day -day life right now. Like, it's kind of like a routine. I wake up at 9, sometimes at 10, sometimes at 7. It just depends on what day it is. But immediately get up, get ready, get dressed, go to school, take the SEPTA, you know. Um, and I feel like I've built myself a routine, you know. I think we all have routines in our day-to-day -day life. Unless, you know, you guys have really interesting lives and you're actually the main character and I'm the side character who's programmed to do a set of things. But, like, I think we can all agree we all have routines in our lives, you know. Maybe it's not school for you. For some people, you have your work routine. You get up at a certain time, you go to work, you go home, hang out with friends, go gym, whatever it may be, you know. And, like... This, this sort of routine, it's like, it's normal for everyone, you know? I think that we function well when we have routines just because it's like predictable. We know that's, that's like, yeah, I know that tomorrow's Tuesday, so my class doesn't start until like, well, for me, my class doesn't start until two, so I can sleep in, you know? I wake up at like 10. And, like, that's the routine that I have, like, for myself every Tuesdays. For you guys, it's, I don't know what it looks like, you know. But I bet we all have our Sunday routines as well. For me, for, like, the past, gosh, how long have I been serving for? Like, probably, like, six years or five years, five or six years. I wake up, try to wake up at 6, but I actually don't get out of bed until, like, 6.10. <laughs> And I have to be at church for sound check at 6.50. And that's harsh, you know. <laughs> so that's like my Sundays. I, I wake up at like 6 or so, get to church by 6.50, and serve upstairs for the first service. Uh, for you guys, maybe you guys come, or you wake up at 9, you get to church at 10. I hope you guys get here at 10 or close to 10, you know, on time. Um. But I feel like sometimes when we get into routines, routines, even though they are, you know, they can get good for us, we, it's, you live a life that's, like, pretty predictable. You can prepare for things. But I feel like routines oftentimes get boring as well. You know, like, how many times do we, like, dread Mondays just because we know that, like, Mondays we go back to school, we got to wake up early, we go back to this routine that feels kind of mundane, kind of stagnant. You know, well, maybe the routine of going to church every Sunday, reading your Bible or praying or going to AGL, whatever it may be, like it can get boring as well. You know, well, this brings me to my title for today. It is the dog days, not the dog days, but the dog days. If you know, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. I think. You guys, or you guys probably have heard of the term, like, you know, the dog days of summer, which is, like, well, I looked it up, but, like, you know, the dog, or dog days means it's just, like, you know, days when you feel stagnant, to, like, within summer when it's, like, really hot and you just don't feel like doing anything, you know. But I looked it up, too, like, dog days also mean stagnation or inactivity, you know. I think I want to point out that dog days in the Christian life is also real. You know, there are periods, there are seasons in our life when we will be stagnant, when we will be, like, it feels like we're not doing anything, you know. There are seasons where God calls us to do a lot of things, to minister, to evangelize, whatever it may be, to serve, but there are also seasons when God just tells us, you know, chillax, bro. It's okay. It's, you, you can relax for, like, this time, you know. But I want to actually put a pin on this topic, and let's just go straight into the word. 
Um, Exodus 24, 12 to 18. Just a bit of context. The Israelites here have already been freed by Moses. They are right now in the wilderness. God told them to go to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai is where Moses is going to talk with God, you know. In the verse, you'll read that, like, like how, how long God was talking to Moses. Um, but without delaying any more in enough witty banter, let's read Exodus 24, 12 to 18. I'll read it for us because it's a lot. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain, stay there, and give you... And I will give you the tablets of stone on which I have inscribed the instructions and commands so you can teach the people. This is the Ten Commandments, the tablets that have the Ten Commandments of God, if you guys don't know. Um, so Moses and his assistant Joshua set out and Moses climbed up the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. Moses told the elders, stay here and wait for us until we come back. Aaron and her, H-U-R, are here with you. If anyone has a dispute while I am gone, consult with them. Then Moses climbed up the mountain and the cloud covered it. You know, a lot of good imagery here. So pretend like we're the Israelites at the bottom, really tall mountain. You can't even see the top because there's already clouds around it. And the glory of the Lord settled down at Mount, on Mount Sinai and, then, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud to the Israelites at the foot of the mountain. The glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. Then Moses disappeared into the cloud as he climbed higher up the mountain. He remained on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. You know, like, I bet you guys are, like, picturing this, you know. There's like a lot of good descriptive words here, just like how tall this mountain here and the clouds around it is actually God and there's fire and it's spectacular, you know. Well, like one thing that you guys probably noticed too is that the only people that went up the mountain is Moses and Joshua. And Joshua probably didn't even go all the way to the top, but Moses like was all the way at the peak, you know. And they stayed up there for 40 days and 40 nights. Like, what's, what does this mean? Like, if you, I mean, if you can tell from, like, context clues, if there's only two people that's going up the mountain, there's still a whole nation's worth of people at the foot of the mountain, you know? Like, if you think about it, like, what were these people doing for 40 days and 40 nights? They weren't talking to God because Moses was talking to God. They didn't have any instructions. They were just freed from slavery from Egypt. And when you're, you know, when you're originally slaves and you've become free, you kind of don't know what you're going to do next. You're waiting for instructions. Just because all you know beforehand is just like being told to do this or being told to do that, you know. And I bet, like, these Israelites, they were confused, lost, bored, you know, because the guy that told them to go out to the wilderness is up on the mountain doing God knows what. Pun intended. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> this is spiritual boredom. You know, that feeling of the void when our experiences as a Christian probably does not feel the same way as it did in the beginning. For the Israelites, they felt, you know, spiritual spectacular things when they were in Egypt. They saw miracles happen. They saw the curses that were put on Pharaoh, you know, the curse of the all the thousands of frogs that went into Egypt and the, the Nile River, the Nile River, <laughs> the Nile River drying up and all those things. But once, once the Israelites are called out into the wilderness, like, they, I don't think they've seen anything else, like, that much spectacular. Probably the closest thing to that is just the, if you read in Exodus, there's the pillar of cloud that leads them by day and a pillar of fire that leads them by night, which is God leading them. You know, that's cool, spectacular things. But it is when they're in the middle of their wilderness and when they're left to their own wills, this is, you know, this is, 
this is spiritual boredom. This is like that point, you know, when they're tested in the wilderness to just see like, okay, this is God's people. What are they going to do when they're waiting? Spiritual boredom is such a dangerous territory to Satan, so we need to know how to respond well to it. And it's it's definitely a real thing. It's not just something that you read in the Bible. It's definitely something that's so real that a lot of Christians feel too. So don't feel like when you feel spiritual boredom, oh, you're the odd one out. When in reality, like I, I felt spiritual boredom. I was bored at a point on like reading the Bible, especially if you've done the one-year Bible challenge. I haven't finished mine yet, but you get to the book of Numbers or those later books in Exodus, you just get lists of names and lists of rules and it gets boring and just like, God, what's the significance of this? You know, why am I reading this? (laughs) But it is such a dangerous territory to stay in. So we need to how to respond well to it. We need to know how to get out of it. Well, today I want to talk about how we should respond to spiritual boredom. And from that, we're going to look at two like, first the Israelites and also David. If you guys know David, we're, he's the guy that killed Goliath. And, yeah, okay. But I, I kind of want to, like, compare and contrast the two, like, how the Israelites responded to their spiritual boredom and how David did. And just we'll go from there. Well, first, how should we respond to spiritual boredom? We should look upon God. I think that's, like, kind of obvious. When you're bored, I feel like our first response is we want to do something. We need stimulus. We want to stimulate ourselves. I want to feel excitement right now, you know. And first and foremost, we should look upon God. Can we open up Exodus 32, verse 1? We can read this together. It is only one verse. Uh, Yeah, one, two, three. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, they gathered together before Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will... I guess need, like, need to conduct you guys. Or... Okay. Just to refresh. Um, come, the people gathered before Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us here from Egypt, we don't know what he's doing. We don't, we, we don't have any instructions, you know. It was like it's funny that the first response that the Israelites, like the response of the Israelites is they choose to build an idol. They're bored of waiting for Moses for 40 days and 40 nights. And if you read, like at the beginning of the verse, it says that, when the people say, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming, so I'm guessing it wasn't just 40 days and 40 nights, it was actually longer than that. You know, who knows, like a few more days or a few more weeks. But it's funny that their first response was like, okay, build an idol. You know, just casually, like it's a normal afternoon thing to do, like, hey, let's build an idol. Um, on that, do you. Do any one of you guys know, like, the game Retro Bowl on the App Store? <laughs> Bro, I'm such a, I don't, I'm, like, start slowly becoming a football geek. I've been playing that game so much on my iPad. That's, like, one of the cons of having an iPad is such a distracting tool as well as it is very helpful. Um, but, you know, like, I try to keep playing the game in a minimum, it's like a football game, you know. It's like pretty cool, but it's like in retro style. And with finals and all this assignments that I gotta do, like I gotta keep it too minimal. And I feel like I should be doing something that's a bit more fulfilling instead, instead of like distracting myself with just a game. I know when my free time is during during my days of the week, like I know when I have breaks between classes and all that. But I feel like I should have been doing something that's a bit more fulfilling or at least productive. But I like to play this game because it's fun. 
And then I realized, it's like, oh, I'm done my hour break for the day between classes. And, oh, it's already time for biology again. Yippee. <laughs> like, it's such a silly story, but it is just a very minor hobby of mine right now. Like, why am I giving you guys this example? Well, maybe when we are spiritually bored, we don't just randomly build an idol like the Israelites, but it's that we turn to idols that give us temporary dopamine, but it doesn't give us eternal joy. We turn to our social media when our Bible app is like the first thing that's on the screen. I know at least for me, I, my home screen, Bible app, top left corner, but I always look in the middle, so I should probably move it down to the middle instead, instead of like the top left of the screen. But we find distractions to waste the time God has given us instead of looking towards God, you know. And now to look at David in Psalm 63 verse 1, David realized this and he said, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. And when we are spiritually bored, it means that we crave a touch from God. It doesn't mean that we're bored of God's word, but we're craving it, you know. So why are we, like, filling this time with anything else but God? Like, David says that my soul thirsts for you, my whole body longs for you. This is, it's, like, kind of silly, but when we fill up our time with, you know, other things when maybe we are longing for God, it's kind of like telling someone, like, oh, you're thirsty? I'll give you pancakes. It's, the, <laughs> it's like a silly thing, but, like, it, it's kind of it's kind of like how I would see it, you know. So first, when we are spiritually bored, we should, you know, first and foremost, look upon God. So next, can we open up to Exodus 32, verses, three, uh, verses 2 to 5? And can we read these verses together? All right. One, two, three. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings. I want water. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Same. Out of Egypt. Aaron. Aaron. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for reading that. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm thirsty, so I want water, not pancakes. Um, yeah, amen. <laughs> like, in these verses, they, okay, Aaron said, okay, we'll build an idol. But before doing so, give me your gold, give me your valuables, your jewels from your family members, and give it to me, and I'll melt it down and build you an idol. You know, it's so interesting that the Israelites are willing to do this. You know, if it was me, I would question, actually, like, what do you mean? These are, like, my prized valuables. These are... This is a family heirloom. Why am I giving this away just for an idol, just for a statue? You know, they're investing all this time and energy and wealth into something that is meaningless. And when, you know, when we love something or when we love someone, we are willing to sacrifice the important things in our lives for it. Like, it didn't matter if the idol they created probably looked very messy. Like, it had probably had, like, bumps or, you know, divots but this idol worked on their own terms you know well second when we are spiritually bored we should be devoted to god specifically and you know the dictionary definition of devotion or being devoted is to put others needs above your own and what the israelites did it's actually the opposite of this. Maybe it does seem like, oh, they're sacrificing 
their wealth, their valuables, just so they can meet God. But no, in reality, they're building an idol on their own terms. They're not waiting for God to to appear. They're doing this on their own terms. And this is completely wrong. This is what we shouldn't do. When reality, we should be devoted to God on his own terms. It doesn't matter if we are in a dry season or if we are being stagnant. You know, are we still need to meet God on his own terms when we're not doing anything? You know, one thing that I do always enjoy at AG Camp the past two years that I've gone, I think it's the probably the God time. Right? Anyone utilize the God time at AG Camp? Don't worry, I won't judge you if you didn't. If you fell asleep at the bongs or if you actually went to the swimming pool or went to the cafe, it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like, this God time, I, I remember the first year, I actually went deep into the woods. And it's like there's a trail. There's, like, a tree. So I climbed over the tree. There's, like, just plastic chairs in the middle of the woods. I was like, it's kind of creepy, but it's kind of cool. So I just sat on it and just read the Bible. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed that. It's, if you don't know what God time is, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's just you spend time with God. You know, as much as we like having fun, we want to encourage you guys to also just experience God in whatever way you can at camp. And we will be utilizing that as well this coming camp. So watch out. But, <laughs> like, whether it's talking to someone about God or whether you're just reading the Bible or just praying or just anything, you know, we want everyone to invest in their relationship with God and however they can. And Psalm 63, 6, verse uh, 6 to 8, David says, I like, I lie awake thinking of you, made it meditating on you through the night because you are my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand hold me securely. We are we should be devoted to God because he's always been devoted to us. He is always good. And it's so easy to think that God is absent when we are spiritually bored. But in reality, God has always been there. Maybe why we haven't felt God is, like in my first point, maybe we haven't been looking towards God. You know, Maybe we haven't been as devoted. Maybe we haven't been as focused on it. So second, how should we respond to spiritual boredom? It's to be more devoted to God. You look upon God. And for my last point, can we open up to Exodus 32, verses 17 to 20? All right. Do we want to try this again one last time? <laughs> okay, let's read it together. One, two, three. And he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made and burned it. Then he ground it into powder. Then he... Yeah, that last verse is very gnarly. Imagine. Moses came down angry. Why are the people worshiping this tiny cow statue? <laughs> Like, that's like, to put it simply, he was so mad, he, I don't know if he purposefully, but I'm guessing he accidentally dropped the tablets that has the Ten Commandments that was made from God. He was so mad that he grabbed that small cow statue, grounded it up, like imagine a pestle and mortar. He did that motion and like poured it in, the, in their water supply. Just like, here, drink this, you know. He was very angry. And if you read a few verses before, like what Moses was doing, he was actually just talking to God. You know, for the Israelites, it probably, it definitely felt like 40 days and 40 nights. But for Moses, it probably only felt like a few hours. You know, because when you, 
when you get to talk to God, maybe when you get to spend time with God, time just doesn't feel real. It just feels like, oh, we've had worship. We had worship night. It's two hours long. Maybe some of you guys do feel that two hours, but for me, I'm playing music and we're going like song to song to song. It feels like it's only been like 15 minutes, you know. Like when you spend time with God, you just lose track of time too. And just imagine like how mad Moses was when, if you read in a few verses before, God actually told Moses, like, yo, look at your people down there. They're not worshiping me. They're worshiping some cow statue that they build from themselves. Like, I would be so bad. I'm spending quality time with God, and these people are bothering me just because they can't be left to their own things, you know? Of course, this is just an exaggeration for effect on my part, too. But, like, I feel like that's how mad Moses was, too. And he was so mad that he made people drink the statue. And here the, here the, you can probably deduce that the, Israel, the Israelites found temporary satisfaction in their idol. But then Moses came down and tore up this brittle statue. I want to point out that the root of boredom is dissatisfaction. You know, that is when you're bored, you find something to do. You try to satisfy yourselves with, you know, worldly pleasures. You indulge in food. You indulge in bad friendships. You indulge in things that might be temporary, but it's not fulfilling or lasting. Just because, like I said previously, you just we just crave this temporary dopamine. You know, the idols of the word are the world are actually very brittle and clunky. You know, like the statue the Israelites made, it is temporary and can be easily destroyed. So my third and final point is to seek satisfaction in God. You know, this past week, not gonna lie, I was pretty restless in figuring out what to talk this week. And just to skip ahead a little bit, on Thursday, I was, if you go to the temple, there, if you go to temple, not to the temple, <laughs> if you go to Temple University, we have, like, there's a really big library. It's called the Charles Library, and I usually like to chill there. But I remember I was on the first floor. I was just at, like, one of the tables, and I was just reading Exodus. You know, I was trying to figure out on, like, how to make my points this week. And there was a table next to me that was kind of an earshot. Like, I could hear what they were talking about, but it was kind of hard to know, like, what they are talking about. Like, not going to lie, it was probably kind of creepy. I took off one of my AirPods and I just, like, just trying to listen. I kind of eavesdropped them. Like, what caught my attention was they were talking about, like, Hebrew stuff. They talked about the Torah and Aramaic. I was just like, oh, okay, they're, Tom they're either Jewish or they have a world religion class or something like that. You know. And I just went back to Exodus, but I still had my AirPod out. And I heard they, were, they, had, they just said this phrase, like, storing up your treasures in heaven. I was like, whoa, that's very Christian ease. If you read your Bible, that verse probably sounds familiar to you, know, you know. At this point, yeah, I was definitely eavesdropping. I heard them say, store up your treasures in heaven. Okay, that's in the New Testament. And I, I know that Judaism doesn't really base their stuff from the New Testament. <laughs> you know, I'm like, wait a minute. This sounds familiar. So I looked up the verse. I, like, I didn't know it off the top of my head. Sorry, guys. Sorry, God. Um, but they were talking about the book of Matthew. So in my curiosity, I just sat next to them. I just said, hey. You guys are talking about the book of Matthew? That's so cool. You know, I actually just went up. Like, the people there that were there, they're much older than me. Two of them were grad students. One of them, I think he is an undergrad student, but he's just older than me. Um, I don't know, I'll ask him when I see them again. But, yeah, I think it's just so cool that, you know, this is just a small group of three people there. 
they just had their Bibles and they're just talking about Matthew, like in a public place. It's not, it's like how we did our Bible study last week in the park. You know, you were just reading the Bible at a public place. I feel like the thing is we make it so complicated when we try to look for satisfaction in God. Like satisfaction in God isn't just in the cool Christian conference events camp, festival, whatever, revival services that you go to. You know, God isn't God isn't a God that is just stuck in one medium, but his glory is all around us. Satisfaction in God is also the meaningful conversations about the gospel that you have with other people. Like what I experience with these people, I'm just like, wow, that's so cool. You know, it's it's in the intimate moments when you have that you have with God in your own time. It's seeing God's creation in the world and being awe of his glory. That's how, that's what it means to have satisfaction in God. And in Psalm 63, verses 2 to 5, David said, I've seen you in your sanctuary and gaze upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. The satisfaction you can have in Jesus is way greater than whatever thing this world can offer you. And actually, I would like to invite the worship team to come up. So how we should respond to spiritual boredom is to look upon God, be devoted to God, and seek satisfaction in God. You know, the thing is to respond to the spiritual boredom, it's, I don't want this sermon to sound like, okay, you guys need to do better. We all need to do better. The thing is, that's not the case at all. Like, I never said you got to look upon God better. You got to be devoted better. Well, maybe I did accidentally said that, so scratch that off if you heard that. (laughs) You got to find satisfaction in God better. No, when we do these things, we don't need to wait until we're better at it and then we approach God because we can just approach God right now and we can look at him. We can focus on him. We can find our satisfaction in him. You know, spiritual boredom is such a real thing, but I don't want this to be a sermon where we got to do better. No, we. I just want to invite everyone to maybe if you haven't to just really approach God, you know, in your in your daily life. You don't have to, you know, it's not a competition. You, got, you don't got to be as good as me. Not saying that I'm good or I'm way better than y'all either. But, like, you know, that's definitely not the answer. We can't look at God if we don't approach him. We can't focus on him if we don't come to him. And we definitely can't be satisfied in him if we never knew what he does in the first place or who he is you know and can we actually open up to the last verses in Matthew 11 20 to 30 I'll read these verses Um, then Jesus said come to me all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. The answer to spiritual boredom is not to do more. It's not to have the best service next week. It's not to keep having events, 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 just so we can get that first high when we first met God. It's about meeting God in our daily lives intentionally. You know, Jesus here, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. It's not, come to me, all of you who are energized and live a perfect life. Because at that point, God doesn't need to give you rest. Rest? (laughs) God doesn't need to give you rest because it seems like you already have everything, like, all together. But God doesn't want you to wait until you get to that point. God just wants you to do that, like, right now. You know, Jesus invites us to go to him not when you're perfect and have it all together, 
not when the next big Christian conference comes to town, not just going to church on Christmas or Easter. But he invites us to go to him right now. Ultimately, we're not the ones that can save ourselves from spiritual boredom, but it's Jesus. Jesus. 